Hello, and welcome to Community Voices, where we talk to Humboldt County's movers and shakers. Today's guest, music producer, label owner, attorney, and radio DJ, Ed Denson. And now here's your host, Paul Versu. Hello and welcome to Access Humboldt's Community Voices. I'm your host, Paul Bersu, and today with a with a true heavyweight, Ed Denson joins us uh, here on Community Voices. Ed, can I indulge you with a little story to start this interview? Uh, you can, but I want you to know I lost 25 pounds during COVID lockdown. I'm not sure I'm a heavyweight anymore. Well, your, your accomplishments are certainly a heavyweight. Just because you're not uh, uh, in that weight class still doesn't matter. Okay. Over 40 years ago, on a winter evening in a softly lit living room uh, in an old house in Arcata, people sitting around and, and, and getting high and listening to music, this old timey guitar music on the record player was Duck Baker, was wafted totally uh, I loved it I, I was just uh, uh, drawn to it and I remember looking at the uh, jacket and reading some of the liner notes but also noticing kicking mule records and so I went and sought out more kicking mule records and then of course that led to looking at Tacoma records and you are the founder of these uh, production companies. I, I'd like to ask you about that. How did you get into that? Well, it began with Tacoma. John Fahey, uh, Tacoma's primary recording artist for the first few years, uh, <clears throat> had brought out a vanity pressing on RCA in the late 50s. And uh, he and I began working together, and um, we uh, we went back and tried to pick up that master, but it had been destroyed by RCA because, um, well, a year had passed. Nobody had claimed it. They tossed it. We had to re-record it. But in the meantime, um, John had sent a postcard to uh Booker White, a blues singer, who was uh, sad in his song. He was from Aberdeen, Mississippi. So John sent him a postcard and said we wanted to record him. Uh, there was money in it for Booker, and he made a big dollar sign, figuring that the postmaster would read it and get it to Booker. Booker had moved to Memphis, but he did get it. Uh, he contacted John. John and I jumped in my Chevy and drove to Memphis and recorded him. And that was the onset of Tacoma Records. We then began releasing John's records as well. And um, off we went. What year was that? It'd be around 66, 67, something like that. We were both living in Berkeley at that time. Um, yeah, I don't think it was earlier than 66. Um, so what was it like in those days rediscovering all the music, rich musical talent that existed in the South? It was a real mixed bag because uh, at that time, there were almost no record labels except the majors and the majors really had no interest in this kind of music because they figured there's no market atlantic had brought out a 12 lp series of alan lomax's field recordings but i had the impression they had done that uh, sort of pro bono rather than pro profit so um we had to start our own record companies. And when we did, then we had to get distribution. Um, it was very much touch and go through there. Um, it took 
some time before, oh, labels like rounder and flying fish and people on that order uh, got set up. Tacoma was one of the first of these labels. And uh, my initial advertising budget was a dollar fifty. I got <laughs> some paper and uh, uh, pens and wrote signs that I stuck up all over Berkeley saying the record was on sale at uh, what was in Tower Records um, and at Lundberg's guitar shop. And to my surprise, people went and bought them. Well, how did you have the feeling that there was that market out there for the type of roots music that you were bringing to people? Um, I don't think I had any feeling so sophisticated. I thought, hey, this is good stuff. I like this. Um, these people are um, really great and significant artists. People should have the opportunity to hear it. We um, frequently in those days pressed records in groups of 100. So we were putting out LPs, but um, carefully, I would say. Tacoma Records took off. Uh, you know, John Fahey was a big star. Wasn't uh, Leo Kotke on Tacoma Records or he was on Rounder Records? He was um, originally on Tacoma. At that point, John was really running the label. So I had no contact with Leo. But that, the, the Leo Kotke stuff sold like nothing before. And as a result, John, who was by that time living in LA, was able to set up an office, hire people. I mean, the whole works. Tacoma was a, a real business there for several years. Uh, I was not in it by that time, however. <clears throat> I was working with Country Joe and the Fish. And tell us about that. You were the manager for Country Joe and the Fish, correct? I was. Um, <clears throat> Country Joe and the Fish began as a chug band in Berkeley. And um, I decided, let's see, who was it? Allen Ginsberg was in town. And Did you I, meet? Yeah, I met him. I decided to put on a, a an event at the... Uh, at UC Berkeley, where, which I was attending. And um, so I got uh, Ginsburg and I got Country Joe and the Fish, the Jug Band, and we got a uh, lab room for one of the, the science classes. And every, the performers stood on the lab bench and performed to, um, well, I don't know, Ginsburg was famous. We must have had 100 people in there. It was another one of these things with day glow posters stuck up and down Telegraph Avenue. But now, did you go back to Woodstock with Country Joe and the Fish? I did. Fantastic. I don't, I wouldn't say back to, but I went to there. Um, that was a close call. Um, the we got the booking because Bill Belmont, who had been Country Joe's road manager, um, was working for the producers of Woodstock, and he told them, you better have Country Joe and the Fish if you want this thing to have any real credibility. Um, from the point of view of who was selling records, that was not true. But from the point of view of expressing uh, feelings held by a large part of that generation, I think it was true. Um, I have vivid memories of Woodstock um, that are coupled with entire blank outs. <laughs> you must be the only one. <laughs> <laughs> well, how long did you wind up managing Country Joe and the Fish? Oh, from maybe 
five, six years into the early 70s. Uh, and they essentially broke up. Um, Joe, at, at that point, he had been anti-war, but he was not anti-soldier. And um, who was it? Jane Fonda, I think, was running a series of coffee houses by military bases and setting up the FTA um, concert series, as in the army. And uh, Joe um, went on to that circuit uh, where he didn't need a manager because it was, you know, it was really uh, quite a basic uh, outfit. So Joe and I parted company at that point on very friendly terms. And what did I do? I must have started kicking you right in there. Right, you started kicking me, or you've had an uh, illustrious radio career as well, correct? I mean, you've, you've been on uh, uh, radio for decades. Well, I was, uh, for a bit in Berkeley, I was on KPFA. Um, I got on during um, normal hours um, with Booker White and a couple of other artists, uh, sort of just bringing them in. And then my friend Michael Sunday got a radio show from like midnight till three. Um, and that was when you did weird stuff. Because after all, who's up? At that right. <laughs> weird people. The weirdest thing we did was uh, we got a bunch of performance artists out of Santa Cruz and they brought a 20-foot piece of kelp in and drummed on it for maybe 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm not sure why that show ended, but I have... <laughs> I mean, did it make it sound? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, in, in at least in the John Cage for recognized, it was music. Right. So did you use or have you used all these years your radio programs to promote uh, both, you know, roots or alternative or or different type of music, not just the kelp uh, drumming? <laughs> yes, we had a for a while. Um, Michael and I had a show during regular hours and Tower Records said you can come and get any record you want take it and play it and then bring it back. So we had access to um, all the whole folkways catalog, all of those sort of things. And we did that for a time. And then one day I went in the store and I went through the bins and I couldn't find anything I wanted to play. So at that point, my radio career took a hiatus. Uh, which and was that head tap? <laughs> changed the way that they had uh, were presenting music, marketing music? Well, you know, um, Chris Strockwitz was the main folk and roots DJ on uh, KPFA. Um, he eventually got booted off when, uh, when they went high, the station went high left uh, political, and they thought folk music was just... Uh, to what would you say, inconsequential. But um, I don't know if it did tower any good for us to play that stuff or not. Um, we certainly were grateful to them and mentioned that that's where we got it. But those were the days still when if you could sell a thousand copies of anything, that was a hit. Well, and that's how, you know, a Duck Baker album winds up in Arcata and, you know, turning on this kid when uh, he's uh, uh, young, you know. I mean, it was just uh, great to be exposed to that kind of stuff. So your career takes a, a change uh, in the 90s when you become a lawyer. You, you've, you've stayed in music, but uh, uh, what, made the, what made you decide to go that direction? 
Well, I should mention that uh, soon after, uh, what was it? There's a radio station that was a precursor to K-Mine. K-E-R-G, right? E-R-G. And soon after they went on the air, I became a DJ for them uh, playing this kind of music. And then uh, when the when they went off the air rather abruptly, um, and I got on uh, KHSU briefly, and then back on the, to Kmon. But where you still are, right? Where I still am. Uh, That's fantastic. I have played. I did a calculation about a year ago. I have played over forty thousand. Tunes, not all different. I understand. But, <laughs> all right, but you queued up forty thousand songs. Forty thousand songs, uh, and enjoyed every minute of it. I was, um, I became a lawyer as an outcome of uh, working with the Earth First on their campaigns uh, in the late eighties, nineties. I was their communication center. We got had a computer and we got a um, a router and we could send an entire page of text in 15 minutes. It was Which is a lot better than uh, having a dollar fifty budget when you first started to come. <laughs> so you were yeah. used to doing it on a fly. So <clears throat> During the Redwood summer, particularly, there were like five, six teams out scattered all around, and we tried to keep them informed as to what the others were doing. So we did that. Um, there, I was also interested in uh, cannabis advocacy and um, a lawsuit came up trying to uh, prevent camp from doing these low altitude uh, helicopter raids. Uh, Ron Senaway and Mel Pearlston were doing that. And my wife, Mary Alice, had been a legal assistant in San Francisco before we uh, moved up here. And she showed me how to do some of this legal work, which we then did for them, and which is, uh, I believe, very beneficial to them because they were shorthanded. Um, and they won that suit. They got a, a serious limitation on what the uh, feds could do with those helicopters, what the what camp could do. And uh, I realized the power of being a lawyer, you had a real power to affect things. I had been a nonviolence preparer for COG, the uh, Citizens Observation Group, uh, for several years, traveling all over um, Southern Humboldt, training people in nonviolent observation of police raids. And, um, well, my mother died, and much to my surprise, this is in 95, uh, she left me a bunch of money. I was uh, not expecting it, but there it was. Uh, so I sold Kicking Mule and um, studied law. So by 1999, I was a lawyer. And how hard was it, uh, especially in those days, to take on the task of cannabis advocacy? Well, um, I did it by being a defense lawyer. And uh, Ron Sinaway had been the main cannabis defense lawyer in Humboldt, but he had a stroke a serious stroke, and he felt he could not 
adequately uh, represent people in the courtroom. It affected his speech. Um, so when I became, he was sort of my mentor through my study. And when I became a lawyer, he uh, recommended to a couple of people who wanted cannabis lawyers that they get me. He did the same for Mark Harris. We were both emerging about the same time. Mark much more spectacularly than I. But <laughs> once the word got around that he was somebody doing cannabis defense in court, um, uh, the customers started coming in and the county was kind enough to, camp to um, create a whole number of people who needed defense. How, and, uh, how has it changed through the process of those days, uh, which, you know, very intense, uh, to the time of legalization and now permitting and whatnot? Well, if, um, because 215 passed in 96, uh, as the 215 cases worked through the courts and the appeal system, the law kept getting better and better and better for people arrested for cannabis. Um, that was true right up to legalization. And it made me look like a genius because <laughs> each year I could get results that the year before would have seemed totally out of reach because of these court decisions. I was working all over from Siskiyou down to Moran. Can, um, can I ask a quick question? The precedents that were being set, was it, and, and you said you were from Siskiyou to Marin. I mean, were, were they all over the state of California? Well, I was working all over the state. The precedents were being set mostly in the First District Court of Appeals in San Francisco, and I wasn't setting them. I was taking advantage of, of right, them. Right, exactly. But, uh, I, it's one of these things where with cannabis law, you were either in it or you were out of it. And most like public defenders and everything were out of it. They didn't have enough time to really get deep into uh, the law and the ins and outs of things. I uh, got one motion, uh, which was very effective, but almost every court I brought it in, uh, I would be told, nobody has ever brought a, a motion like this before. They'd never heard of it. And in fact, sometimes the public defenders would tell me the judge will never go for this. But in fact, judges like law. And the motion was based on law. So I started getting some uh, spectacular wins. Share the motion with us. Now I'm on the edge of my seat here. What, it, what was the uh, approach that you took? Well, the motion was simple enough. Um, if I'm remembering my numbers, right? Health and Safety Code, which is where all the cannabis laws are, uh, 11470, let's say nine, um, detail what the police had to do to gather the evidence. Uh, in the case. And uh, in those days, it mattered how many plants there were, how many pounds there were. Uh, that no longer is a factor in the law, but it, after legalization. But um, routinely, the police did not, in fact, do what they were supposed to do. They, and they destroyed the evidence that is, they didn't take 800 cannabis plants and put them in an evidence room so that somebody could count them. They didn't take pictures sufficient to prove how many plants there were. And likewise, males, weights, oh, there's a ton of stuff you could find out if you could actually look at the plants. 
But you couldn't look at the plants because they had destroyed them. They kept a 10-pound sample, but that hardly tells you how many plants this came from or even where it came from. So I would file a motion saying, because the police have destroyed the evidence, it's not possible to defend this case. That violates my uh, client's constitutional rights, and the judges tended to agree with me, throw the cases out. Well, the, the precedent of allowing a case to be tried on destroyed evidence would be detrimental to every case. Uh, so the judges thought, and, um, and, you know, the law was really quite specific. This, this was not a case of where the police could say, oh, well, the way we understood it, this and that, because there was really only one way to understand it. Anyway, um, then came legalization. And in terms of uh, cannabis law, it made major changes. And one of them was that uh, the number of plants you grew or the number of pounds you had no longer mattered. Simple possession or simple cultivation was just a misdemeanor instead of a felony, as they had been. And as misdemeanors, um, you were almost guaranteed probation and uh, the authorities lost interest in prosecuting that way. What they became interested in was prosecuting uh, environmental violations attached to cannabis, which made the cannabis a felony. Um, and the, their favorite, of course, was water. If you were watering your pot by throwing a pump in the creek, um, that could turn everything into a felony. And uh, I can't say that that dissuaded people, but the county then began using civil law, land use, zoning regulations, instead of criminal law to go after pot growers. And that has resulted in, that's been the bulk of my practice since then. And, um, it has resulted in a great many injustices done, some of which I've been able to correct and some of which I haven't. Are you still practicing? Oh, yeah. That's Got fantastic. It. There's so much more to ask you about. I feel like this is Ed Denson part one, uh, but uh, our time is up on uh, community voices at this time. I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for that record I listened to all those years ago in that living room uh, that, you know, sparked my interest in uh, that kind of music. And then, you know, once you hanging out with people that are listening to the, you know, all the nice things that have happened in Humboldt County, it was a distinct moment. And when I was doing the, the uh, uh, preparation, I was, just thrilled uh, that I'd get a chance to talk to you. So I appreciate that uh, greatly. Um, uh, nice to speak with you. And by the way, Duck Baker is still alive uh, in England, and he's put out a number of more records. So keep your eyes. Can look him up. I hadn't thought of Duck Baker in years until I was uh, getting ready. Um, anyway, so... That's going to do it for this uh, edition of Community Voices with Ed Denson. Thank you so much, and I hope we get a chance uh, to talk again. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, you know, I I haven't really uh, uh, talked to anybody that met Allen Ginsberg. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much for Access Humboldt. This is Paul Brasseau thanking Ed Denson and signing off. This has been Community Voices with your host, Paul Bursu. Thank you for joining us. If you represent a nonprofit organization 
and are interested in being a guest on Community Voices, send an email to info at accesshumble.net or call 476-1798. Axis Humboldt, local voices through community media.